Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're going to look at a Bowers and Wilkins. This is a Zeppelin air speaker and this unit that came into the workshop was the generation 1 or first generation. In terms of general specifications, 1 times 50 watt bass speaker and then you have 2 times 25 watt mid-range stroke tweeters and then for your inputs it supports iPod and you can see in the photograph 2, 3, 4 and 5th generation. Also the iPhone 4G and then on the rear 3.5 millimeter jack for your aux input and that's supposed both analog or digital and then you'll also have your S video composite for images and video and then overall dimensions you're looking at a height of 173 millimeters by a width of 640 and then a depth of 208 it is a substantially well built unit so it is heavy and that comes in at 7.5 kilograms and it was produced back in 2008 now the customer Holly Langford contacted me via the YouTube channel. She'd seen the previous repair video and I put a note in the description if you want to follow along with that one. And I'm glad that she did because these units are really, really good in terms of sound quality when they're operating correctly. But for many customers who own them, uh, sadly Bauer and Wilkins really don't provide very good support. And it's not just the fact that these are dated back to 2008. Just trying to get any sort of service information or spare parts proves very difficult. And I would imagine at the time, you know, it's quite a considerable outlay that the customer would have paid for these units. So it's really a shame that they can't be repaired. For this repair, it is different to the previous repair video, but it is linked to the power supply failure. So we'll sort of get into that as we go through. Now, in terms of disassembly for this speaker unit, what you have to do first off is you have to remove the dust cover. So on the previous photograph, you can see the dust covers on the left and the right hand side, and you just slide those off. But what I would say is you have to press from the end because there's a small little locking latch, and then just try and push the covers away and then they will slide off. If they've never been removed, it's going to be quite difficult to remove them. What I would advise you not to do is to use like a metal screwdriver because you're going to damage the polished sort of metal fascia unit and maybe damage also the speaker grills. Now, once you've removed those side grill panels or, or dust covers, the next thing you have to go underneath. And what you have is a mounting stand and there's a rubber mat which prevents the unit from sliding around. You need to peel that off. Now it uses self-adhesive tape to hold it in place. So when you come to reassemble, remove all of the old self-adhesive tape, reapply new tape, and then you can then just push it into position and it will just stick. There's no securing screws. When it is removed, you'll find that there are security torque screws underneath. And then once you've done that, turn the unit around and then what you'll find is that you have multiple screws which will then secure the back and the front fascia together. And it sort of comes apart like a shell and what i'm showing here is the rear and what you can see is lots of this sort of white material but again that's normal you know nothing is untoward there it's just acoustic foam wadding and those sort of pipes that you see going at the back again picking up them from the audio and transferring and then you also have a series of multi ribbon connectors just be very careful that you need to remove the multi ribbon connector which is connecting to the iPod mounting stand on the front fascia you know don't be sort of too robust and just sort of pot it because you may not be be aware that it's there you know just take your time you don't want to damage that ribbon connector and then here what I'm showing you is really where everything happens. So the left and the right hand side, you can see that these are your mid-range speakers. There's also tweeters right on the end. And then that big unit in the middle is the bass speaker. And again, just be very, very careful how you position in this. You know, you don't want to sort of maybe damage the speaker. So I just have like a small sort of mounting plate that I put the Zeppelin speaker onto. And that prevents that the speakers being indented or maybe damaged to the cones. Um, particularly the tweeters right on the end as well. And then here what we're showing you is this is the microprocessor board which is mounted directly onto the power amplifier module. So this is where everything happens, all the smart stuff takes place. And then here what we're showing you is where the power supply should have been. When this unit was disassembled, what I found was that the power supply was rattling around inside and you also found parts of these four fixing posts. Now, this doesn't mean that the amplifier has received any form of rough handling that has resulted in that. That's not the case. What happens with these mounting is that they become brittle and they just break away. So what you have to do and what I do is I just cut them back so they're all the same height 
and then what I'll do as part of the repair is I will then make good those fixing posts so that the four fixing screws will go in and then that will then secure the power supply in place. On the previous repair tutorial that wasn't the case you know you didn't find mounting posts had broken away but for this one it just required you know, that extra work to be done. Now, what was the issue when the speaker came into the workshop? Well, what Holly reported was that the unit wouldn't power up. And when I did the initial test phase, sure enough, confirmed that that was the case. Now, what I'm showing you here is the switch mode power supply for the unit. And of course, it's been removed. Just to the rear of it, what you can see that there is a transparent cover. And this is just a protection cover, just because of the high voltage which are associated with these switch mode power supplies. So the two bigger electrolytic capacitors, which have that label on, they're sort of rated at about 350 to 400 volts, and they're 47 microfarads. What I would also bring to your attention as well is that this power supply is providing two output voltages. Normally a 25 volt power supply, main power amplifier stage, and it's also providing a 5 volt supply as well, not only for the microcontroller, but other associated circuits. Now on the first repair tutorial, for that one again the unit wouldn't power up. And what I found was that the protection fuse here, which I'm pointing to, had blown. And what had blown that was a number of rectification diodes on the primary of the power supply. But what I found was that when I made the voltage measurement for the switch mode power supply, what you see here is a zoomed in view. The multi-pin connector, on the left hand side I'm indicating the ground tab, you can sort of put your meter on there. And then you can power up the switch mode power supply directly from your main supply. And then if you count left going to the right where you see the heat sink with the power component mounted onto it, the third pin in you should measure 24 volts DC. And then the next one to it you should be measuring 5 volts DC. Now when I did the test, of course the protection fuse hadn't blown and I could verify that the switch mode power supply was running and there was high voltage across the switch mode power supply smoothing capacitors. But what I found was that the 24 volts stroke 25 volts DC was missing. So a little bit of a strange sort of fault. Now, normally with switch mode power supplies, you know, they sort of tend to fail catastrophically. So the point to emphasize here is you know, maybe you could try and source one of these switch mode power supplies, but sort of looking at the age of the unit, I think that would be more difficult to try and do. And also as well, remember that the generation one that this unit is also use Rubicon electrolytic capacitors. What I found and what is commonplace is on the later generation of speakers, they used lower cost, cheaper electrolytics, which was detrimental. And if you sort of search on forums, you'll find out that these electrolytic capacitors, of course, commonly fail and you get this bulging effect on the top where they are venting. But the good thing here for the Gen 1 is they're all Rubicon. So as part of the fault finding for the switch mode power supply, I also check the ESR and the capacitance value. And as would be expected with Rubicon caps, you know, absolutely spot on in terms of the value and no high ESR at all. So the question here is, what's causing this issue for the loss of the 24 volt stroke 25 volt DC supply? Well, what I'm showing you here is the underneath of the switch mode power supply and normal sort of checks that you make, you know, you sort of visualizing to say, okay, is there any sort of obvious things like maybe a dry joint, bad solder joint, something's heat related, but nothing too obvious but there was a heat related issue that you could see and I've sort of highlighted it here. Now the point to emphasize is that there is no service information for this switch mode power supply. You know there's no circuit schematic and then when you look here on the underneath of the circuit board and this is where the surface mount components in the vast majority are located what you see is there's no component reference numbers. So for example it doesn't say R10, R11 so you can identify what they are. What I've highlighted here, there seemed to be quite a lot of heat dissipation in this area. You could see discoloration of the board and these two surface main components also look to be overheated. Now, when you did the in-circuit measurement with the multimeter, what you found both these resistors were sort of about six and a half plus mega ohms. So remove them from the board, make sure you, know, you could just test them out of circuit. And then when they were on the bench, you could see that not only were they reading up of six meg, they were also drifting and completely unstable. So that told you that those resistors had gone open circuit. Now the ohmic value for these resistors is 56 kilo ohms. And again, without the circuit schematic, you know, it's more difficult to sort of 
look in detail of where these are associated with the circuit. But of course they are associated with that secondary DC supply for the power amp stage. And one of the resistors also feeds the collector of a smaller surface mount signal transistor on the board. So straightforward enough then to remove those resistors. But what I've done here, and if I sort of zoom in again and give you a, a more detailed view, you can see that there are two brand new surface mount 56k arm resistors that have been installed. But what I've done is I've slightly increased the wattage. Just if there is any degree of heat dissipation, then that should provide some more longevity with regard to those resistors. You know, you don't really want to have the, the sort of the issue where these components are being stressed and any resistor, you know, logically will always fail if it's being overdriven in terms of, of wattage and the amount of current that's passing through it. So once these two resistors were replaced, again, out of circuit, you know, it doesn't have to be inside the power amplifier, just powered it back up again and straight away you know that 24 stroke 25 volt supply could then be measured i was confident it could then be installed back into the speaker so here on the next shot what we're showing you is the switch mode power supply has been put in place probably just one sort of other thing as well with regard to the switch mode power supply on the voltages what I'm referring to here, and I've sort of gone back and I'm sort of showing you the photograph, you can see that it gives you the specification. So it's shown on the output connector, and this is what's on that white label stuck across the power supply electrolytics. What you have is a plus 25 volt supply, and that's rated at 1 amp. And then the 5 volt supply is rated at 1.5 amp, and then that's continuous. So if you were in such a situation that you could not repair this, maybe something catastrophic had happened and you know the circuit was burnt out and the circuit board was heavily damaged. In theory, by knowing the voltage on the secondary, you could probably source an equivalent switch mile power supply to replace it. So in theory, you probably could recover the operation of the speaker. And as I said, so here the switch mile power supply has been mounted back in. And uh, as I said, I also took the opportunity to repair the support pillows. And then the final thing, of course, is really just to put the smart speaker onto test. And you operate it from the top. So once you initialize it, what you'll find is that the LED will then illuminate blue as it goes through a self-check phase. And then it will then come then to green. Now, the other thing to mention as well is it sort of has an auto sense. So if you connect live audio to maybe the AUX input, as soon as you power it up and there is audio playing, it will detect that and it will switch that input through automatically. And then also on the front, you can adjust the plus and minus to increase or to decrease the volume control. And as I said, you know, the unit was put on extensive test, probably for about four or five hours, and it performed faultlessly. And as I said, worthwhile to repair these units. Excellent sound quality that's coming through from them. And then here what I'm showing you is just the two little surface mount resistors. So not the most exciting photograph that you see in there, but just to sort of highlight those are the two components that were removed. And then the final part, um, for anybody who has undertook any repair work on these, um, if you ever have to put these dust covers back on and it's something you've never done before and you can sort of google forums and lots of people have experienced this it almost seems like some kind of ancient art that you have to perfect to get them on because this is the second one i've done you know it only took me you know a couple of minutes to do it but it's not easy right and from one of the comments on the first repair video someone had actually i think worked as a service technician for bauer and wilkins and there was a special test jig that they had to put these on so my advice is that you have to sort of put pressure on the left and right hand side of these speaker protection covers and just press it in and then you can then just slide it directly into the slide grooves and then they will then snap in place. If you don't sort of put the pressure just to compress them in, you're probably not going to be able to replace the covers and get them into the right position. So that really sort of brings us to the end of this repair tutorial. So as always, I really appreciate you stopping by. And if you require any help, support or information, by all means, email audio amplifier servicing at AOL.com. And I'll be more than happy to come back to you and provide any guidance that you may require. So until the next time, I wish you all the very best. Cheers and bye bye.